Welcome back students. So in the last session you saw how ammonia is removed from all the different amino acids goes to glutamate and glutamate is now undergone oxidative deamination and released its ammonia. So what happens to this ammonia? Where is this released? This is released in the liver, liver mitochondria by the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase. So this is one mechanism by which ammonia is formed in the body. And what happens to it, we'll talk later, but are there any other mechanisms by which ammonia can be formed? So there are the different ways, as I said, the oxidative deamination by amino acid oxidases. There is one more mechanism by which oxidative deamination can take place, that is L-amino oxidase. Now the activity of this is low and it is not so significant, but it results in the formation of this corresponding keto acid and ammonia and it uses FMN. Again, from the point of view of MCQ, that is the reason I've just told you about L-amino oxidase. D-amino oxidase, activity is more than that of L-amino oxidase. And where are D-amino acids formed? Remember, our body is mainly made up of L-amino acids. So, D-amino acids are found in plants and cell walls of microorganism. So, they are present in the diet metabolized in the liver by D-amino oxidase. The difference between this is it results in the formation of its corresponding keto acid definitely and ammonia definitely but uses FAD. L-amino oxidase uses FMN, D-amino oxidase uses FAD. Again MCQ it might be asked so hence this emphasized. Now this keto acid that is formed is converted to its L-isomer or it is further catabolized. So we now to summarize how nitrogen Trojan is removed from the different amino acids. Are there any other mechanism? So transamination, as I said, transfer of amino group to glutamate. We have got ALT, AST. Oxidative deamination, release of ammonia directly by glutamate dehydrogenase, L-amino oxidase and D-amino oxidase. Is there any other mechanism? Once I have told you oxidative deamination, naturally there might be some other mechanism which is known as the non-oxidative deamination. So are there mechanisms by which the body can release ammonia without oxidizing? Yes, they are and they are called as amino acid dehydratase. This is a special amino acid dehydratase is a special uh, enzyme which can uh, remove water and help in the liberation of ammonia. Now classic example for this is serine to pyruvate, serine or cysteine to pyruvate. Let's not talk more about it again just for the sake of MCQ point of view, amino acid dehydratase. They are also called as amino acid desulfhydrases. What does this mean? Sulfhydrases? It means sulfur is also removed along with this. This is uh, especially important in sulfur containing amino acid metabolism that is cysteine is converted to pyruvate. I am just giving I will be talking about these amino acids and their metabolism when I will be touching upon these uh, different enzymes. Now another important uh, enzyme is histidase. What does histidase do? It uh, catabolizes histidine, converts histidine to urocanic acid. Again, I will be repeating about this. So right now just remember that histidase can res also result in the formation of ammonia. So ammonia is formed. Is this, this is, from where does this ammonia come? All this time, whatever I talked, they were all from amino acids. That is transamination, oxidative deamination, non-oxidative deamination. What I was talking of only and only amino acids, amino acids which have come from protein. So are there any other nitrogen containing substances which can also liberate ammonia? You know that nitrogen is present in DNA, nitrogen is present in RNA. So nitrogen, can these liberate nitrogen as ammonia? Yes, we have other substances also which contribute to the formation of ammonia. Let us look at them from amino acids, I told you by different mechanisms. The amino groups of purines and pyrimidines also contribute to formation of ammonia. Another important is action of intestinal bacterial urease on urea. We will talk about this more in detail. This assumes importance especially when there is liver damage. So 
the action of intestinal bacterial so if this urease is present within a bacteria the bacteria is present in the intestine so if urea reaches the intestine this can be acted upon by urease it results in the release of ammonia and this ammonia is absorbed back into the blood so this blood also contains some amount of ammonia which has come from the intestine by the action of intestinal bacterial urease other than that ammonia is also formed because of the biogenic amines also now let us see how ammonia is transported we came to know that ammonia is formed in different places different cells purines and pyrimidine degradation degradation is occurring in uh, all over the body amino acid catabolism is occurring in all different tissues within the body different cells within the body so how is it transported and remember this glutamate dehydrogenase is present in the liver and urea cycle is happening in the liver so something must be there to transport all this ammonia from different places to the liver so how is it transported and this brings us to the transport of ammonia remember ammonia is very very highly toxic so it is very essential it should be transported in its non toxic form so how can it be transported one of the most important transporter is glutamine now i have used the word glutamine what's the difference between glutamine and alpha ketoglutarate alpha ketoglutarate what is it this is a keto acid when to simplify to tell it simply when alpha keto glutarate takes up one molecule of ammonia it gets converted to glutamate i am writing it as glu the accepted abbreviation when glutamate takes up one more molecule of ammonia it gets converted to glutamine so gln glutamine accepted abbreviation for glutamine so you look here if glutamine is going to transport ammonia it can take up as many as two molecules of ammonia and it can transport it is glutamine what is glutamine glutamine is a amino acid so it won't cause any toxicity within the blood to any tissue so this is one glutamine is a very good form by which ammonia is transported within the body alanine is one more form by which ammonia is transported within the body what is happening in alanine alanine has got has come from pyruvate pyruvate is the alpha keto acid pyruvate takes up ammonia i'll just show it here only and form alanine so alanine is also can transport one molecule of ammo of ammonia so where is this important alanine transport where is it important you have heard of glucose alanine cycle so when the muscle wants to transport its ammonia in a non toxic form it uses alanine it takes up the pyruvate that is there and converts it into alanine this is alt alanine transaminase glutamine alanine so in most of the tissues this reaction by which glutamine is formed from glutamine from glutamate is you know, this enzyme which take puts up this ammonia into glutamate is called as glutamine synthetase this requires energy and it comes from it comes from atp so glutamate to glutamine requires energy the enzyme is glutamine synthetase look at this reaction now glutamine is a non toxic transport form of ammonia and glutamine what happens to glutamine further how is it com coming back to form glutamate when does it release ammonia we need another mechanism another enzyme and this enzyme is known as glutaminase where is this enzyme present where glutamine is converted to glutamate glutaminase is present in the liver naturally why ammonia has to be detoxified in the in the liver so naturally glutaminase this reverse reaction will definitely be present in the liver where else it is present many a times this ammonia needs to be excreted out into the urine where it can help in the for help in the acid base balance especially the tubular acid base balance balance of the tubular fluid acid base balance is brought about by ammonia how this ammonia can take up one more proton and get converted to ammonium nh4 
but so when it forms ammonium NH4Cl, it combined with a chloride ion forms ammonium chloride, which is excreted out from the body. So this type, that is acid-base balance. Let us not talk about it right now. Let us focus on glutaminase, which is present in the liver. So it is glutamine is cleaved by glutaminase in the liver to produce glutamate and ammonia. In muscles, we have the glucose alanine cycle, which is responsible for the transport of alanine. So let us talk now what happens to this ammonia that has come into the liver. What is its fate? What will happen to it? Now, the fate of ammonia depends upon the type of animal that is there. So we have got amnotelic animals. Most of the aquatic animals are amnotelic animals. That is, they just liberate this ammonia into the surrounding water. Ammonia is liberated as such. They excrete nitrogen as ammonia without any problem. These are called as the amnotelic animals. Now, we have one more category, the uricotelic animals. So, the animals which can convert ammonia to uric acid are called as uricotelic animals. Most of the reptiles and birds are uricotelic. Why they, why they prefer uric acid is, uric acid is basically insoluble. They can form aggregates and can be easily released from the body of the reptiles and the birds. So, they are called as uricotelic animals. Ureotelic animals. This requires again water for the excretion of urea, and uh, most of the, all the mammals, including man, are ureotelic animals. Remember, urea is water soluble, non toxic, and can be e easily excreted in the urine. So, let us talk about how ammonia is detoxified in the liver cells. What is happening to this ammonia? We call this as the urea cycle, whereby ammonia is converted into urea. This cycle, urea cycle, is also called as is also called as Krebs Hanselite cycle. You have heard of Krebs cycle. What is Krebs cycle? Krebs cycle is citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle. Whereas Krebs Hanselite cycle is the urea cycle. Where is this taking place? Now before we go further, let us look at the structure of urea. Urea is made up of one carbon with a double bond oxygen. Two amino groups NH2, NH2. So, what are what contributes this amino group or the amino groups come from which amino acids and C comes from where? So, the ammonia contributes to this amino group, aspartate contributes to this amino group. So, from where did aspartate and ammonia come? And C comes from carbon dioxide. Ammonia has been released from glutamate. Glutamate dehydrogenase releases ammonia. Aspartate also comes from glutamate. Glutamate is converted to aspartate and this contributes to the amino group. So basically we can see here that glutamate is a contributor of the nitrogen in for the whole of the u of the urea molecule. Some of the other either directly or indirectly ammonia has come from amino group has come from the glutamate residues. So glutamate or glutamine which is a transporter has helped in the con uh, formation of urea. So let us talk of the urea cycle. Point to be remembered is urea is the end product of protein metabolism and it is produced in the liver. The cycle is partly mitochondrial and partly cytosolic. Some part of the urea cycle is happening in the liver mitochondria and some part is happening in the cytosol. Where, what happens to this urea once it is found? It is transported out from the liver cells but, and it is uh, contributes to the blood urea levels and then it is excreted by the kidneys. So most of the times the problems with the urea levels is because of kidney problems rather than because of the liver problems. So blood urea estimation is a part of the kidney function test and not a part of the liver function. So this is the major organic compound which is present in urine. So let us look at the urea cycle. Now the first reaction is no, catalyzed by the enzyme carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1. Now I will just give you simply in a very simple manner. Uh, how urea cycle is taking place it is you have got the mitochondria and this is the cytosol so in the mitochondria what happens is ammonia reacts with carbon dioxide and 
in the formation of uh, with the use of energy ATP is used it forms carbamyl phosphate I'm just using it as short form carbamyl phosphate as I said reactions are not important for you the enzyme is carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 which uses ATP and two molecules are used in this stage to form ATP is converted to AAP carbamyl phosphate what else happens to this what is the next reaction it goes undergoes uh, reacts with uh, Carbamyl phosphate reacts with uh, ornithin in the presence of the enzyme ornithin transcarbamylase. Look at the enzyme name ornithin transcarbamylase. So I am just writing to you OT ornithin trans ornithin it reacts with uh, ornithin to form citrulline. I am just writing short forms. Uh, so carbamyl phosphate reacts with ornithine to form citrulline. Citrulline can be transported out. We have a transporter for citrulline which can transport citrulline out of the mitochondria. Once the citrulline goes out into the mitochondria, what happens? It reacts with a molecule of aspartate to form arginino-succinate. This reaction is catalyzed by arginino-succinate synthase. Please look here, arginino succinate synthase. So it reacts with one molecule of aspartate, aspartate to form arginino succinate. Arginino succinate synthase is the enzyme which again utilizes ATP. Aspartate has given its ammonic, ammonia, ammonial group to form arginino succinate. Arginino succinate is again cleaved. Now arginino succinate is cleaved by arginino succinate lyase. So what does it form? It forms arginine and it forms arginine. I will just write here arginine and it releases fumarate. It releases fumarate. So uh, ammonia is combined with carbon dioxide to form carbamyl phosphate which reacts with ornithine. Ornithine from citrulline goes out. Citrulline is converted, reacts with aspartate to form arginine succinate which is lyase to release fumarate and arginine. Arginine is one important enzyme. I just rub it out here so that you can be, this is still occurring in the cytosol. Arginine where the most important reaction which is taking place, let me just put it like this. Arginine is now cleaved cleaved by the enzyme arginase to release urea. Urea is released and it forms ornithine and ornithine is transported out. It is a simple set of reaction. Ca ammonia plus carbon dioxide, carbamyl phosphate, citrulline, arginino-succinate, arginine, ornithine and ornithine comes back. So let us look at what will happen uh, further. So arginino succinate lyase to form arginase. What is important here? Fumarate is released. Where have we heard of fumarate? Fumarate is an intermediate of the TCA cycle. So what? So if it is an intermediate of the TCA cycle. Fumarate can be further, it forms a link with, it forms a link with the TCA cycle. Fumarate, what happens to further, further to fumarate? Fumarate is converted to malate, malate is converted to oxaloacetate, malate, malate is converted to oxaloacetate and oxaloacetate is converted to aspartate. So from where did aspartate come? Aspartate also came from glutamate. Remember oxaloacetate to aspartate is a transamination reaction. So glutamate gave its ammonia group to oxaloacetate from aspartate. So from urea, we have glutamate which contributed its amino group to urea. This ammonia also came from glutamate. So glutamate gave its ammonial group to uh, released ammonia by glutamate dehydrogenase and urea. So finally, the molecules of amino, the amino groups of urea came from glutamate itself, either from ammonia or from this glutamate, glutamate to aspartate and then it has formed urea. So that is the importance of these reactions. So this link, it is also called as urea cycle, TCA cycle, bicycle because again this is one more cycle, this is one more cycle, it is a bicycle because of its links 
with the TCA cycle. And here important is there is no net utilization of ornithine. What are the energetics? Four high energy bonds are utilized for the synthesis of one molecule of urea. Uh, MCQ question that can be asked. Please note that you have got carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 is present within the mitochondria. CPS1 is present in the mitochondria. Is there any CPS2? When 1 is there, naturally 2 has to be there. So, where is this CPS2? Carbamyl phosphate CPS2. Uh, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 2 is involved in pyrimidine synthesis and it is present in the cytosol. One characteristic feature is it is not activated by N-acetyl glutamate whereas CPS1 is activated by N-acetyl glutamate. So, what is this N-acetyl glutamate? Let us look at the regulation you will come to know of it. The rate limiting reaction is the regulatory enzyme that is CPS1. N-acetyl glutamate is an essential activator for CPS1. What is this N-acetyl glutamate? It has come from acetyl-CoA and glutamate and arginine is an activator for this synthetase. So to simplify this, let me just take one minute to tell you from where did N-acetyl glutamate come to show you again the importance of glutamate. Please remember glutamate gave one ammonia, glutamate formed aspartate which was in, incorporated into urea. Now glutamate is going to regulate the regulatory enzyme also. How? It will combine with acetyl-CoA plus glutamate to form N-acetyl glutamate which will stimulate CPS1. Okay? Now which will stimulate CPS1. So what is happening? Glutamate has seem to that the, uh, whenever glutamate levels increases CPS1 is stimulated and urea cycle is stimulated at the same time this is also under the control of this is a synthetase which is under the control of arginine okay arginine will stimulate this synthesis of N-acetyl glutamate okay N-acetyl glutamate is synthesized from acetyl-CoA and glutamate and arginine is an activator of this synthesis Synthetase. So, after a meal, there is increased production of both arginine and glutamate, which leads to the production of N-acetyl glutamate and then activation of the urea cycle, where I will talk about the metabolic defects of urea cycle in the next session. So, right now we saw that how ammonia, how glutamate is helps in the conversion, helps in the transport of ammonia, how glutamate regulates the whole of the urea cycle, how glutamate gives out its ammonia, how glutamate releases aspartate and finally there is urea formation in the liver. This cycle is happening partly mitochondrial and partly cytosolic. So let us start the next session with the metabolic defects of urea cycle. Thank you.